Hello friends, welcome to Art Scene, a monthly web TV series celebrating art in the Hudson Valley. I'm your host, Chronogram Editor Brian Mahoney. Each month we'll bring you into artist studios, visit museums, talk about process with artists, and visit historic places of artistic significance. Art Scene is produced by independent filmmaker Stephen Blauweiss. Kate Hamilton has been studying and practicing the language of clothes as a costumer, hat maker, and artist for many years. She invited Tona Wilson to create projections and Jonathan Elliott to compose music for her installation, It's a Big World in There, at the church space in Rosendale. I love the shirt because it reminds you of shelter. It's a doorway that you can enter into. It has a front opening and it has arms that will enwrap you, perhaps. It's a wonderful, wonderful shape for an absent human being or an absent God or an absent being, but it's very warm and benevolent. In working in the church space, I really wanted to do something that was definitely female. I know it was a crowd. It was probably too much to have in there in one space, but I wanted people to wander through. I wanted people to have the feeling of going somewhere behind something and someone on the other side of the room couldn't see you. And I also was very excited about the idea of working with projections. At some point, the church and the ladders, which were all over the place for Kate to hang things, um, they were everywhere, these gigantic ladders. And it reminded me of Moby Dick, because there's a scene at the beginning of Moby Dick of the Whalesman's Chapel or the Fisherman's Chapel, in which the priest climbs up to his pulpit by a rope ladder. And the garments were huge and white, but the other part is that Woody was helping us a lot. He is part of the Women's Studio Workshop. There was this whole beginning of working with boats that Woody brought in. He is an excellent sailor, and he was able to show me all sorts of knots that sailors use. That made it possible for us to think about viewers coming and pulling ropes and becoming sailors and then making these sails move and then the moment that these garment sails began to move they started making sounds like they were cracking in the wind. They would go louder and then they would go softer. The sound of the clothing, aka sails, aka rigging, um, and so on, worked together with Jonathan's music in a very yeah. wonderful way. And what he worked with for this project was the sound of bells, organ. He brought in some folk songs, bringing people back in. He did a little bit of heartbeat, and then psalms you know, working with things that sounded like psalms. And then what he thought about churches, especially a former church, this was a former church, that they are a repository for memories, perhaps. He wanted to bring a sense of that into his soundtrack. It was a matter of us creating these three different layers, putting them together, and then offering, this is a place that you can come into, what do you do with it? 
The interaction of the audience is what made the whole piece become exciting. Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, is often depicted with a blacksmith's hammer. Beginners can follow in Vulcan's footsteps and learn the art of blacksmithing at the Center for Metal Arts in the Orange County hamlet of Florida. Here at the Center for Metal Arts, we're interested primarily in education. We want to offer beginners and advanced metalsmiths and blacksmiths an opportunity to either start from the ground up or come in here with experience and really develop a certain technique or style, or come in and, and work personally with, with Laurie or myself um, in, a, in an open studio atmosphere. We do offer classes for the very beginner who's never touched a piece of metal. Small metals and blacksmithing are very complementary. And when you integrate the two together, it can really bring your work to a much more professional level. Combining non-ferrous material with forged iron is really attractive to us. And to, to have all of the equipment and tools necessary to forge iron. Yeah, they say some of the best blacksmiths started out as jewelry makers. It's easy to make blacksmithing a really clunky, heavy-handed thing. So if you have that finesse and attention to detail, it really takes it to the next level. As a beginner, you don't realize that it's a tool that's causing the problem, you know, and you're starting out and you don't know how a tool is supposed to feel and how it's supposed to work exactly. And then when you use the right tool, it helps so much and you realize, I can do this and it's not as hard as I thought it was. I'm not fumbling around and the piece isn't falling on the ground. I'm very passionate about tool making and even before I came here I've made all my own tools for forging and it's satisfying to make the tool and then put it to use to make your sculptural work. So it's, it's important for me to make tools for the shop where every student has the right set of tongs, every student has an anvil that has the right hardy tools, they've got a hammer that's appropriate weight for them and there's matching sets for every student. That way no student is struggling and one student's doing really well. You're all given an equal opportunity with tools that I've made personally that I know work really well. You really connect with the work when you've actually made the tools to make the work. And you can customize your tools in so many different ways and make them to be exactly what you want. By using the tools, the tools inevitably get better because you're like, okay, I like this aspect of this tool, but I wish the handle was a little shorter or, you know, I wish the face of the hammer was rounded out a little more. So you can just keep evolving them and making them better and more specialized and we really like that. We had another image planned for the cover of the March issue. Then we saw Franco Vo's photographs from our spring fashion shoot, and we realized that his shot of Simi Stone just had to be the cover. The image on this month's cover is of Simi Stone, a local musician here in the Hudson Valley. We photographed her at BSP in Kingston, and the idea was to illustrate a bunch of musicians in current fashion. So I got into portraiture for a couple reasons. One, I'm a fan of psychology. I love analyzing people and what makes them really work. For me, photography is one of those things that allows me to actually look into someone, really kind of spend a few minutes with them, and within that time, I can kind of really figure out what they like, what they don't like about themselves, and how to accentuate positive parts about them. 
to me, that is a basic of portrait photography. And most good portrait photographers really are really good listeners and have the ability to make people comfortable. There's a certain relationship I like to have with my subject that allows for trust to happen fairly quickly. So many of the calls I do get are for people that need photographs for specific reasons. And that really dictates how we're going to approach it, where we're going to approach it. I shoot both in the studio and on location. Both are fun. I like location quite a bit in that it has so many variables. It really pushes you to be uncomfortable all the time and you can't rely on a lot of set things. Weather can change, the backgrounds can move, anything can happen. The studio is much easier, however the studio runs the risk of being more sterile. So in the studio you have to experiment a little bit more with your lighting and your approach to make it more interesting. But in the end they're both very, very needed. There is a place for both of them. So when I'm shooting it, that's one of the first questions I ask someone is, you know, do you want to be in a real environment? Do you want to be in a studio? And then we kind of take it from there. So on a lot of shoots, we try to bring in outside help. And by that, I mean hair and makeup, retouchers, or even stylists for clothing. There are many reasons why when you look at through a magazine, images look the way they do. It's not just the photography, because photography in itself is a small part of it. The bigger component to all of this is when you start adding in many people. And when people start suggesting or adding their approaches to it, that's when you have a great image. I have made some great images on my own, but I've made many, many more better images with the help of other people. So a lot of times I will get asked, what should I wear? How should I do my hair? And this is a very tough question to ask because I have my opinions, of course. A lot of what I do is about making someone very, very calm in front of the camera. So I do tell them, what would you want to wear? What do you like? And if there's something that's not working in the camera, then I'll make my point about saying that. But for a lot of things I do, I tend to not over direct. I like to set up a situation and let people run with it and let them react within that situation. And then I get what I need. If the situation is not giving me what I need, I'll set up a new situation. So many times I'm asked by people if they should get into photography as a career. And I tell them all the same thing. In those few seconds that you're picking up a camera, looking through it and interacting with someone, you go into your own world. It's a very unique experience to have with another person, a very intimate experience. And it's really very, very fulfilling. If you can get paid to do something you really love, it's really great. And I, you know, I encourage everybody to try doing that. Other times it's, it's a job like every other job, but for the most part, it has been a, a great experience in the last 20 some odd years. Before there was cable television, there was pirate television. Curator Andrew Engel talks about the pioneering video collective, The Video Freaks, and the exhibit, The Art of Guerrilla Television, at the Dorsky Museum of Art. So the origins of The Video Freaks go back to Woodstock. Most people didn't have access to this equipment at that time in 1969, or they were just beginning to. Then they were soon hired by a CBS producer who had already had the idea of doing a TV magazine program about the counterculture. He felt that CBS and the other networks were lagging behind in covering what was going on with youth movements at the time. He heard about the video freaks through a mailroom clerk named Lou Brill, who was also at Woodstock, along with other staff who ended up becoming video freaks. Quickly after they were hired by CBS and became part of the video freaks, they presented this live event for the CBS executives and all their freaky friends in the downtown Soho loft. It was a spectacular failure, but it allowed the Video Freaks to begin the work that made them most known in the video community, and that was for Lanesville Television. Today, a lot of artists are involved with social practice, socially engaged art, working within communities as part of their art practice. And the Video Freaks were doing this 
in Lanesville, in this tiny hamlet in Greene County of around 300 people, producing all original content, many times in collaboration with residents of Lanesville. Lanesville TV ran from 1972 to 1977, it usually was on once a week. They had a range of programming, a children's program called the Buckaroo Bart Show, which is based on a TV Western. They had the Lanesville TV news buggy, which was action news in the town of Lanesville, where there was a car accident here, or there was a cow that was born. Bart Friedman would push a stroller along the highways of Lanesville with the porta pack camera in the news buggy, and he would collect news. And sometimes he would say, when you're traveling along the roads with the Lanesville TV news buggy, it's sometimes peanuts and sometimes shells. The Video Freaks were an important contributor to the downtown art scene in New York. They worked on various installations, including a project for Vision and Television, which was the first ever museum exhibition of video art. They were there to document what was going on in the exhibition and teach other students how to use video equipment. Education and engagement were always an important part of their art practice. They actually received money from the New York State Council on the Arts to do mobile media workshops across New York State. So while they were doing these education initiatives, they would also create uh, their own artworks, either as, as a group or as individuals. So for example, we have a four-channel video installation in the exhibition that was newly restored to explore multi-monitor installation. Many people today are standing on the shoulders of the video freaks. And those people include activists in Zuccotti Park, in Gezi Park, uh, in Tahrir Square. Everyone who has access to portable video today can appreciate what the video freaks did with much more primitive analog technology back in the 70s. They set an example for so many today who are demanding greater media democracy. Although the internet wasn't born, the video freaks have paved the way for so many to use video and media creatively. We hope you enjoyed the show. Tune in each month for a new episode uncovering the artistic community of the Hudson Valley. And remember, buy local art.